Lesbian bars have been a pillar of American queer culture since the 1930s. At their height, there were over 200 lesbian bars across the U.S., but today, only 21 remain. These spaces are crucial to the queer community, so why are they disappearing? Many historians believe the first lesbian bar was Mona's 440 Club, which opened in San Francisco in 1936. At the time, the LGBTQ community faced immense discrimination, and bars were some of the few places where people could be themselves. It wasn't just about loving women, but it was about a whole cultural underground that didn't exist anywhere else except in that milieu. But even those weren't free of harassment. In New York, the State Liquor Authority could revoke licenses and force bars to close if they were disorderly. And that included serving alcohol to anyone who was gay. So most lesbian bars in New York City were run by the mafia. Violent police raids were common. And anyone caught dancing with a same-sex partner could be arrested. But after years of protests and riots, this began to change. The gay rights movement was gaining momentum, and so was the feminist movement. In the 1950s, women couldn't get a business loan without a male co-signer. And in some states like California, it was illegal for women to be bartenders. But by the early 70s, women were making strides in the fight for equal rights. They aren't privileged demands at all. We just want what men have had all these years. And this paved the way for more women to actually own lesbian bars. Leslie Cohn and three other women opened Sahara in 1976. And women walked in the first night and they gasped because they were so used to these dives and they couldn't believe that they had an elegant space. Leslie says it was the first women-owned lesbian club in New York. But that's something they had to hide from the state liquor authority. If we had said we were gay, we would not have gotten a license. There's no doubt. It was hard enough to, to be women. While Sahara closed its doors in 1979, the number of lesbian bars was still growing. After that, women got involved in the business and it became a whole different ballgame. By 1987, there were at least 206 lesbian bars in the U.S. Henrietta Hudson first opened its doors in 1991, when the lesbian bar scene was booming in cities like New York. So there was Meow Mix in the East Village, which was kind of like a rock and roll theme. They had a lot of live bands. There was Julie's Uptown, which is a little more like Uptown, a little more sophisticated. And there was Ruby Fruit, which was a little bit of an older crowd. There was the Fat Cat, Crazy Nannies. And Henrietta's was at the heart of it all, even attracting celebrities. Sandra and Madonna were hanging out, right? So Madonna would come in, Melissa Etheridge. It was, you know, it was wild. It was totally wild. But it wouldn't last long. Gentrification sent rent prices through the roof and displaced residents who frequented these bars. The average rent in Greenwich Village rose 27% between 2000 and 2012, shutting down neighborhood fixtures like Ruby Fruit. In San Francisco, the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment increased from about $2,000 in 2004 to $3,300 in 2013. Businesses were getting priced out and closing. You know, you'd hear about it all the time. Leela Thurkeeld was the owner of the last lesbian bar in San Francisco. My landlord started to mess with me and broke my lease and all of a sudden said, your rent's doubling and you're on a 30-day term. So I knew they were pretty much trying to get me out and that they were following these trends. The Lexington Club closed in 2015 after nearly 20 years in business. People came from all over the country to come through and say goodbye. And it was incredibly hard, but really meaningful. When that closed in 2015, uh, there were shockwaves around the country. That was like a huge, huge loss to um, the United States and to the queer women in San Francisco. Income disparities between men and women are another reason it's hard to keep these bars open. Of course, there's always the reason of women not having the funds that men have. And some also blame online dating, and even an increased acceptance of the LGBTQ community. 
the shift to online culture, that definitely contributes to it, online dating. Uh, the bars don't really necessarily serve as a meeting place for dating anymore. Lesbians moved to Maplewood, New Jersey and stuff, and they assimilated into society pretty quickly. By 2019, there were reportedly only 15 lesbian bars left in the entire country. And in New York City, there were only three. Then the pandemic hit, and all of them temporarily closed. For many, it was a wake-up call about just how important lesbian bars are. We had nothing but time to reflect on the importance of gathering spaces. These spaces are so important to the community. They're unique, and they're also, they're more than bars. That's when Elena Street and Erica Rose co-founded the Lesbian Bar Project. They spent a year documenting the remaining bars across the country. In October 2020, they launched a campaign that raised over $117,000 in a month. It was incredible. We really didn't expect the community to really respond to it so well and so positively. They started a second fundraiser in June 2021 with a goal of $200,000. The funds are being used to support the remaining lesbian bars, like hers in Mobile, Alabama. Owners Rachel and Sheila Smallman opened the bar in October 2019. My wife and I were constantly traveling, trying to find a place to hang out as our true self, as lesbians. And along the coast, there are very various gay bars, but none specific to women. Now it's the only lesbian bar in the state. But it has attracted people from all over the South, where lesbian bars and LGBTQ safe spaces can be scarce. Lesbians come in from North Alabama, from parts of Florida, parts of Louisiana, and northern parts of Mississippi as well. What I was doing was trying to find a space where I can go and be myself. And I didn't know so many other people wanted to find a space that they can go and be themselves as well. Everything became uncertain when the pandemic hit and Alabama implemented a lockdown in March 2020. When we had to shut our doors, we didn't know what to expect. The donations they received from loyal customers were crucial for their reopening two months later. And that was one of our busiest days. It was like people were raring to get back in here. It was a really good day that day. <laughs> For Henrietta's, it took another year to be able to open its doors again. But when it did, the community showed up to celebrate. I've actually been coming to Henrietta Hudson since 1994. It was the first lesbian bar I ever walked into when I was around 25 years old. You feel safe. Like you relate, you know, to the people here. Like it feels like home, for sure. This place is also just such a symbol of our community, of a queer bar, a bar that is built by lesbians, and um, it's just really wonderful and so just heartwarming almost to see it reopen and to see it survive this past year. To them, these spaces are more than just bars. It's not just about a place where you go to have a drink with friends. It's a place that takes a real stance on political issues and issues that impact queer and trans folks. And it took a long time to get here. And a younger generation needs to understand that an older generation had to fight for them to have the privileges, the entitlements, and the rights that they get to enjoy today. But even though LGBTQ rights have come a long way, there is still a lot of work to be done. A lot of the lesbian bars in the past were exclusionary to trans women and trans men and to non-binary people and to people of color. And now the bars are making like a concerted effort to open their doors to everyone. Henrietta's officially rebranded as a queer human bar, though Lisa says they've been using this language for years. We are a queer human bar built by lesbians. We want everybody to know all folks are welcome. Lesbian bars have been invaluable to the queer community for over a century. There was a lot of people who came to San Francisco and that was the first place they went, where they found housing, where they found a group of friends, where they found a date. I think it really served the community in a way that I just feel really proud of. And it really did that for a long time. And despite everything standing in their way, lesbian bar owners are determined to keep these safe spaces open. Our business has kept getting stronger and better. So I'm glad that we did not make the decision to shut it down. 
our community is strong and our community won't back down and we've seen decades of political protest and you know fighting for our rights and I think that this isn't the end it's just the beginning. There was never ever a doubt in my mind I was going to reopen. Right now we're in our 30th year of business and I wasn't going to let something knock me out like that. I have to stay open. It's not a choice. It's a it's an obligation.